Thanks, Will. Um, oh, crikey, it's on, right. Can you all hear me? Yeah, cool. Hello, hi, thanks for coming on a, on a Thursday afternoon, because I'm sure you've got other things to do, like, like working at the studio and stuff. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm Jerry from Tate Harmer. Um, we're an architect practice. Uh, there's about 20 of us sat in a room in Dalston drawing buildings. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is just show you four, three or four projects that are on our books right now, because it shows where we're at. This is kind of a technical lecture. I got told to do a sort of technical lecture. So we're going to talk about some stuff that I've kind of learnt, that we've kind of learnt as we've done sustainable buildings. We've been going for 10 years now. Um, and we're going to feed into that a bit of sort of work that we've done and things like that. So, so that's going to be the format. It's about 45 minutes long, I think. So um, uh, Will's totally right. We have just won um, quite a few large competitions as a practice. So do send us your CVs when you're, if you're finishing up. Um, we, um, we just won um, this, which is a new creative centre for York St John University. So it's all of the creative things that they teach, like fashion, animation, games design, and, and a new theatre, all kind of wrapped up into one building. Um, and the idea of it is it's all about collaboration. So, so this is project sort of one of four, which I'm going to show you, which we just got in our books right now. It just shows you where we're at. The really important thing is it's like a landscape-led scheme, right? So it's all about how the landscape and the campus and the master plan go together. And it's got this big kind of landscape atrium space, which has got better recently, um, which is all about collaboration and people mixing together. And the theatre has this great view of York St John. This is just introducing you to the kind of work we're doing. Um, this is project number two, which is on our books right now, keeping us busy. This is a Museum of Scouting up in Chingford. Um, in Gilwell Park, which is where the Scouts are based, and is actually where Baden Powell first started training the Scouts. And it's, so it's a heritage landscape, uh, and it's also they get sort of 5,000 Scouts coming every year. So our, our big design move is a really non architectural thing. We, we made a, a big colourful tent right in the middle of the museum that the Scouts can go in, and when they're there, they can start understanding more about Scout heritage without necessarily going into the museum because big groups of teenagers and these artifacts don't necessarily mix. Um, but again, it's one of these things that's kind of half building, half landscape. So we have a lot of kind of very close relationships with the landscape architects we work with. Uh, this is project number three, which I'm going to show you, just to show you what we're up to right now. Um, this is another one of those large projects that we've just won. Uh, this is called Eschelt Positive Living. So Eschelt, if you ever watch Emmerdale on telly, Eschelt's where they film Emmerdale, so that's where the Woolpack pub is. What they don't show you is there's a massive sewage treatment plant right next to it. Um, so we're working with Yorkshire Water at the moment to convert that into uh, 160 houses uh, and, and sort of a million square feet of commercial space. But the really important thing is they've still got an active waterworks on the site, and that makes more heat and more water than they know what to do with, more grey water. So we, we can make a development that has sort of an infinite amount of grey water and an infinite amount of heat, and from that we can make a carbon-positive development. So it's quite, that's quite a sort of exciting project. Um, it's all in Greenbelt, so again, it's massively landscape-led. Um, I don't know if you've come across Greenbelt yet in your studies, but it, that's a sort of designation of protected green area around a city, although it is brownfield land, and, and this is in its sort of context. You can see we've got these green fingers of landscape coming in, which basically break up the mass of the scheme. Um, and so this lecture is all about, it's supposed to be all about sustainability. Uh, and I sort of, I've got a real fascination with sustainability and with sort of natural environments and kind of threading those two together. And it started because I used to work uh, a long time ago for Grimshaw Architects. Um, and I was like the site guy for the Eden Project down in Cornwall. So I was like the project architect who had to go down and make the Eden Project kind of get built, if that makes sense. Um, and the, one of the projects that I sort of designed and built from scratch was, was this one, which is the education centre at Eden, uh, called The Core, which is a sort of fantastic um, double-curved glue lamb frame building, all based on a philotactic pattern. And we've just completed um, a refurbishment of this building with, with a £3 million Wellcome Trust grant. And you might have seen this in the press recently, which is a new art piece by Studio Swine, so we did sort of we we helped them make it happen. If you like, don't ever work with artists. They never give any credit. It's awful. Um, but this is a giant cyanobacteria that spits out smoke rings that smell of Earth's history. And if you're into 
Biology, cyanobacteria make about 70% of the world's oxygen and sort of sit in the ocean, churning out oxygen. Um, and so this is where I kind of cut my teeth uh, on this kind of stuff. So it's timber framed. Um, it's very people-centric design. It's sort of immersive educational design. And it, and it, and it taught me a lot about how, how to kind of practice as an architect. And for the last 10 years, we've still kept working with Eden. So we've done uh, uh, a rainforest canopy walkway for them up in the rainforest. If you've been to Eden, it's basically the, the key thing at Eden are these big kind of biomes, right? These big kind of greenhouses. So the main greenhouse where the jungle is is the size of Trafalgar Square in terms of area. Uh, and it's um, got, really got a it's the sort of largest rainforest in captivity, is the way you can describe it. But we've helped them build a series of bridges which take you up onto the, onto the high level so you can look around the canopy. And over the course of our practice over the last 10 years, we, we, we've built a lot of stuff, basically. So I think we've done about 25 houses now, something like that. Um, things like this, you know, this is on Grand Designs. This is our first project when we started. Uh, and when we first started, we were, we were like the Eden Project people and we could do a house, right? That, that's what we were doing. But it meant that I've now, we've now done 25 sustainable houses. And so a lot of what I'm talking to you today about is going to be what we've learned doing that, really. Um, and there's, there's a big variety. There's common denominators through a lot of them. A lot of them are timber framed. A lot of them are in sensitive landscape settings. Um, uh, you know, three of them are passive house. So a lot of them are kind of fabric first. We're always trying to minimize them and keep them as simple as possible. And, you know, it's now, like Will said, it's leading on to bigger work. So um, uh, this is a project we just finished in Leicestershire, um, sort of a series of 28 lodges and a, and a wedding venue for a, for a hotel called Hothorpe Hall, threaded through some woodlands. So sustainability. Um, we've, we've got quite an attitude now about sustainability. And, you know, the first thing to say, it's a really overused word. Everyone's sustainable. You can buy sustainable oil boilers now, I think. So it's kind of nuts how it's uh, uh, being almost misused. Sustainability, I really like things like the oldest Huxley definition in, in the book Island, if you've ever read that, where it's all about appropriate technology. You know, what we always try to do as a practice is make very simple, clear, and easy to read and operate buildings. There's quite a lot of... Um, evidence that buildings that are very complicated don't perform how they're supposed to because people don't understand how to use them. So what's really nice is if you're too hot, you open a window. If you're too cold, you turn on a radiator. I mean, that, that's kind of like the level that a building operates well. And the other thing you find with sustainability is that quite often you're arguing about um, being sustainable or, or sort of saving money. And that, that's, that's a sort of binary approach. And one of the things about trying to keep it as simple as possible and building it into like, the fabric of the building is you can, you can circumvent that discussion. So it, you don't need a sort of additional system. And the other thing on sustainability is, is this sort of triangle. Although I had a bit of an we had an argument in the office today about, uh, about some of my, my word choices here, actually natural. But there is like you're always making this decision when you're trying to choose a sustainable material. You can, you can get performance or cost or performance and a natural material, but you can't get all three at the same time. So, for example, um, if I wanted to do a really high U-value hempcrete wall, so I'll show you hempcrete in a minute. It's sort of like, like a Weetabix wall, but it's made of lime and hemp. You've got to spend a lot of money to make that happen. So it's natural, and to get it high performance, you can't have a low-cost wall. But if you want a really high-performance wall, um, but you don't care about it being natural, you could have... 350 mil of rock wool. Now, rock wool is just is exactly that. It's melted rock, right? So it's sort of stranded rock. It's not really a natural material, and it's got a high energy content. But you know, you can meet these two criteria, but just not that one. So, so that's a sort of another debate that you're quite often having when when you're going through kind of like trying to make a green specification. And I split the rest of the talk up into sort of three bits, and they're slightly false. So forgive me, but. One of them is the external fabric, like the fabric of the building. And that's the thing that we concentrate on as a practice all the time. Because the fabric is the bit that's going to stay there for a long time. And the fabric is the bit that people kind of understand and that they use. Um, and then I'm going to talk about systems, which is the stuff really to compensate for what you haven't done in the fabric. So I'll show you in a minute a passive house where there's almost 
no systems except for an MVHR, so you have no heating system, for example. So whatever you can't achieve with the building fabric, you then fix with a system, essentially. Um, and the third thing we'll touch on is, is materials and material choices as well. So I've tried to keep it informative because it's supposed to be technical, right? Um, so external fabric. Um, one of the really important things about external fabric is it's about the building in operation more than it is about building the building. It's about both, but, but these are the total um, carbon emissions for a building, whether it's timber or, or masonry, um, embodied versus operational, right? So basically, you should care more about operational than about embodied. I mean, you should care about both, but worry more about operational. And because um, it's technical, I've thrown some technical things in here, so I'm going to show you stuff, right? Show you how to build a house. So uh, I'm going to run through superstructure, substructure, all those things, just look at quickly some different techniques, and then we're going to see how it all wraps up into uh, like the last house we built, basically. Um, so these are sort of all the techniques that we've ever used building sustainable houses, essentially. And uh, we tried to use others. There's things like rammed earth slabs, if anyone has ever gone into any research of that, you can have a sort of rammed earth and linseed slab. We've never really got those to fit budgets or time scales or any of those kind of things. Um, but you know, you can have a beam and block, which has got like a, it's got a better embodied energy content. It's kind of better because it's precast. Um, it's quite tricky to detail with no cold bridges. So you'll see, although that's a thermal block, you know, the, there's a bit of a cold bridge there. Um, RC slabs, so, so this is actually the environmental editor of the Independence House, with a big RC slab and, you know, a ridiculous, like, 250 mil of rigid insulation here. Um, and we've managed to fix the thermal break problem, so there's no thermal bridging, but you've got a big lump of concrete, that's not so good, you know, so there's kind of things between the two. Um, these are two different systems, just to confuse you. The top one is a boulevard system, um, and the bottom one is a passive house building. But the two key things about both of these, and the reason I call them innovative, is that these are all absolutely no thermal, kind of no thermal bridges in them at all. So with the passive house, this is rigid insulation kind of entirely wrapping the slab. And then with the boulevard system, you essentially have um, a, a pile system, and then everything sits on one insulated um, plank, essentially, and then there's a screed that goes on top of that. So really sort of innovative foundation systems just have managed to get rid of all thermal bridging which is really important because the ground, you know, you, you don't want to be kind of directly touching the ground. And then um, I'm, I'm sort of you know, insisting it's a technical lecture, so this is, is more technical stuff. These are the three different ways that we've built stuff. Um, other building methods are available. But the mainly, we always build it with this here, timber frame. Because the trouble with masonry, and I put this picture in because this is, this is, a, this is really annoying me, this is on site. So, if you try and super insulate a masonry wall, what you end up with is, uh, so that's about 300 mil of rockfall there, that's 100 slabs. So you get 100, 300, n another 100, and that's hydroscopic, so I've got rid of the cavity. But essentially, that, that's like half a metre of wall to get something which you could fix in about 400 mil, 350 mil, in something like timber frame. So something like that build up, because you just don't have these extra big, thick layers of 100. So it's very space inefficient to do a super insulated masonry wall. Um, and steel, for us, is something that's quite new. We don't, we've never done steel houses. We've always steered away from steel. But we're having to now deal with steel because the buildings that we're doing have got so much bigger. And it becomes very difficult to make them work in timber with the spans that you need for things like um, large span teaching spaces. So we're having to start working out how, to, how we feel about steel and can we fill it with timber, um, can we avoid using concrete slabs everywhere, all these kind of things. And because I love timber, I thought I'd show you all the bits of timber as well. Is this too technical? I don't know if this is too technical or not. Is it okay? All right, good. I did think it was meant to be a technical lecture. All right, so these are all, all, the, um, these are all different ways you can build timber. And what tends to happen is you don't really make a decision about which one of these you use. You, you tend to actually do all different methods in different bits of the building and depending on what you need to do. So essentially, that's the cheapest, right? Open stud frame. So... Either they're, either they're made on site by, by literally a carpenter with bits of wood and he's knocking them together, or they're prefabricated in a factory, which is what normally happens where you make kind of wall panels. Essentially, having a bare timber frame that you then fill with, in with insulation and you kind of skin it, that's what generally happens because it's the most cost-effective thing to do. Closed panel um, 
is something they do a lot more on the continent. It's very high quality because you know, it turns up on site already skinned with the insulation in it. And you can have things like you know, the conduits and all the electrics already in it and everything. I mean, even the windows here. See the windows? This is a project we did in Italy, actually. So this is, this is a sort of Austrian contractor who was uh, very serious and dare about everything. Um, so anyway. <laughs> and um, anyway, so that's yeah, super high quality but more expensive. SIPs um, went out of fashion for a bit because it got too expensive, but it's now good value again. And SIPs is like a really nice thing, actually. SIPs is sort of basically two bits of OSB sandwiched against a bit of rigid insulation. So it's very thermally efficient. You get wonderful air tightness. It's structural. Um, it's kind of a nice material SIPs. You can't really expose it on the inside because it is a bit... Um, clients don't like the look of it quite often. So um, unlike CLT which is sort of the material of the moment. So CLT is sort of bits of wood cross-laid, essentially making kind of like plywood on steroids. And we find that CLT is a beautiful, beautiful material and fantastically expensive. So we quite often don't manage to get it into projects. We do, so like at York St John at the moment now, with the posh atrium space, that's all CLT because you need something high quality and robust there. But, you know, it's hard to justify making a series of houses out of it. And then glue lamb is what you use when you do big spans. So glue lamb is essentially lots of bits of wood glued together to create a kind of large timber beam. But the thing is, if you use just a big bit of wood, like if you just cut down a tree and made a beam out of it, that moves around. So it's very difficult and you get big, big cracks in it. The reason you do glue lamb is because it's super stable. So once you get sort of small bits of spruce and glue them together, then you've got a really stable structural material. So that's timber frame, because I love timber frame. Most of our buildings are timber. And then um, I thought I'd talk about insulation, because that's kind of fun, isn't it? Um, so then what, what can you use for insulation? And this is a little bit back to that, you know, we were talking about the cost versus performance versus naturalness thing. So these two on the right here, they're sort of natural-ish, in inverted commas. The top one's hempcrete. You remember I was talking about this kind of wall made of Weetabix. So it's lime and hemp, and you tamp it down with some shuttering, and it turns into this sort of solid lime and hemp wall. It's really lovely material. It's a bit kind of labour-intensive. There's a lot of this happening in the West Country at the moment, hempcrete, because it's quite low tech, so you could build your own house out of hempcrete. Um, warm cell, um, which is essentially recycled newspaper and paper, and you blow it into, blow it into the box. So here, there's a cladding panel here, and he's blowing the warm cell in. It's like porridge when it goes in. Um, versus things like sips and rigid insulation, or, or the most cost-effective thing, which is mineral wool, really. So quite often we're using mineral wool, because you know, it works really well, it gives good performance, it's kind of slightly less evil and rigid, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's good value. Um, so then, what I wanted to show you was a building where sort of all the fabric is correct, if, if you see what I mean. So where you've made all the right choices, um, so that you've got a building that doesn't need a heating system anymore. So this is a project that we've just finished in Flamstead, a uh, little village near St Albans. And it's a certified passive house. So it just got certified a couple of weeks ago, which is brilliant. Uh, now, passive house is a German standard invented by a guy called Wolfgang Feist, and he's a physicist. And it's, it is essentially a giant Excel spreadsheet. So if you're interested, you can download it for about 100 quid. I'm sure you can get it free, actually, here, to be honest with you. But it's, 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 it's just completely accurate about the energy use of your building. And so it steers you to orientate your building in a certain way and put the windows in a certain place and all these kind of things. And if you do everything correctly, you don't need a heating system. Um, so this particular building, the question it's trying to answer is, how do you do a really contemporary kind of passive house building design in, in what is quite a traditional village? So although it is obviously a kind of timber frame building, we're, we're taking cues like eaves heights, like the half dormer windows you can see here, um, like the general shape and size and massing, and it's tying in with, with the location of Flamstead and making this kind of new, new, lovely rural cottage, passive retreat sort of thing with a dog. Um, and there's a dog again. Um, there, you know, and there's things like, um, you know, in the basic building design, there's things like we've got a double height space, which actually, passive house, because it's designed by a physicist, doesn't really care about voids, but it doesn't like them because that affects your external envelope to internal floor area ratio in a bad way. But, you know, voids are really great because then you don't have to turn the lights on. So if you have a deep building, it lets more light in. 
it's good reducing energy use. So there are some sort of ways you can justify it. Um, so the way a passive house works in you know, basic terms is you wrap the whole thing in insulation, like a lot of insulation. So um, the, that Kintyre house has about 350 mil of insulation to 400 mil, depending on where it is exactly in the building. So that, that's, that's a lot. There are no, there's nothing structural touching the outside world. So it's completely like a tea cosy over it. Um, and the building, and this is a bit that people don't like, the building is very airtight. So in the winter, you keep the windows shut generally. Um, and the heat of the building comes from the sun and from the people who are living in it. So that's the things that are heating this building up. And you get fresh air through an MVHR system, which is a mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But essentially what that does is it extracts stale air from wet places like the toilets and the bathrooms and all those kind of places. And it puts fresh air into the living rooms and the hallways and all that. But when it does that, it swaps the heat over. So you don't lose any heat by constantly extracting out of the toilets. So you're always getting fresh air, but you're not losing any of the heat. Um, so these are, these are the drawings. So you can see here, you know, comparing the size of a normal wall to the size of the external walls, you know, you've got this kind of massive tea cosy essentially going around the building. So it's like having this weird, thick, thick little bubble around it, um, which is kind of nice. Yeah, and this is it in sections. So you can see here, you know, the rigid insulation going right around the slab here. Massive amount of insulation there. Um, uh, and you can see we've got this kind of open wedge joist because you've got to get the ducting along for the MVHR. So the one system you have got is this mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. But this building has no heating system at all. Um, by the way, you can open the windows in the summer. So obviously in the summer, it doesn't matter because you don't need to heat it. So you can just open the building, all the air goes through, it's fine. Uh, and if you can see the red line here, that's quite important. That's the airtight line. So when you do a passive house, on all the drawings, there's this sort of red line. And that red line is your, your air barrier. Um, so essentially, that's, uh, that's a vapour barrier, really. But it's a taped vapour barrier. And you have to buy a special tape and do special details all around. It's very, very tricky to get the air tightness. It's, it's 0.8 pascals, um, 0.8 air changes per pascal per cubic metre of building. Uh, and building regs is about 10. So it's, it's like a tenth of the building regs acceptable air tightness. And so you can see even in the details here that you've always got this air tightness barrier feeding through, which is, you know, the, the critical thing, really. And then I'll just sort of show you this. You can see the air, that's the air tightness barrier there as it's getting built. So this is it before it got finished. And you can see the open web joists here. Can you see the ducting, the white ducting just up there? I'll, I'll try the laser. Hold on. There. So that's the air, that's the ducting, so that's for the fresh air. And there's a nice picture. Uh, yeah, I mean, the nice thing about a passive house is the contractors who do them are really into quality. Because if you, if, you're, if you do a bad quality passive house, it just doesn't work because you don't get the air tightness and the whole thing falls apart. But it means that then you end up with someone who really cares about their work. So, you know, they do lovely detailing and beautiful joinery. You know, you actually end up with a really, really good house because you've made the decision to do a passive house. And I think, you know, that's... One of the things that we really enjoy about them is, is you can get a really great house when you do a passive house. It's a good kind of people-centric thing to do. Um, yeah, there you go. There's the kitchen. I want to talk about systems now. So systems are the things you do to compensate for the fact that you haven't built the building properly, I think, really, or you haven't made the external fabric work. Um, some are kind of essential. Uh, and, and some uh, a, a bolt on. And again, in the office, we've got um, a bit of an attitude about bolt ons. And bolt ons are things where you're kind of compensating. Uh, you're basically doing a carbon compensate scheme where you, you're, you're um, generating electricity, say, through a PV panel because you, you're using electricity elsewhere rather than making an efficient building. So, um, again, sorry, technical lecture. So, I've done technical stuff. If you're doing a house, Unless you're doing a passive house, you're going to have to have a primary heat source. And um, essentially, this is sort of pretty much the range of what you can have. So you can either have a heat pump, which is like a fridge gone wrong. You know, it's, it's like the back of a fridge, but working the other way around. And a heat pump essentially has a little refrigerant loop in it, which goes from um, something like minus 45 to plus 120. And it needs a three degree temperature difference from outside. 
and then it can make a plus 45 degree temperature difference for your water system. So that's kind of what it's doing. And you can either do it through an air handling unit, you can get that three degree temperature difference through an air handling unit or through pipes in the ground or pipes in the water. Um, biomass is quite simple, you, you burn wood. Um, and there's lots of different versions available. You can burn wood pellets, uh, which are kind of self-feeding boilers, which are great. You don't only have to feed those every, every you know, week or if you've got a massive hopper every month or sometimes every three months. Or you can have um, just burning kind of straight round wood, just put that in, uh, and then you tend to have to put it on you know, once a day, once every other day, but you've got to have a big thermal store kind of thing. So it's a bit more effort, biomass. Um, CHPs are... Well, gas boilers, actually, do them first. So gas boilers sort of like feel a bit basic and not very cool, but the truth is that um, gas has a reasonably good kind of carbon content. And if you, if you do straight carbon counts, you're better off making a more efficient building and having just a small little gas boiler than you are doing anything else. So, you know, a heat pump is like eight grand, a biomass boiler can be 16, um, you know, these are one grand. So, you know, if you can spend that money on something else, that's where you should do it. Um, and then a CHP was supposed to be the answer, but it hasn't worked out quite so well. So a CHP is essentially a gas boiler that uses the heat that it would have thrown away to make electricity. Um, I had a CHP in my house and I had to, I had to get rid of it because it just kept breaking every six months. So there is a bit of a problem at the moment with CHPs. I mean, there's also a problem with sort of um, uh, CHPs at, at larger scales as well, so that the biomass CHP um, down at Beddington in BedZ, that, that keeps going wrong as well. So th there's a sort of, you know, CHPs are very complicated things, there's just a lot to go wrong. And it, so that's primary heat source, you've probably got to have that. You've almost certainly got to have electrics. So there's a few sort of, you know, basics uh, we think on electrics. One of them is have a master switch. So that, uh, hang on, I'll use a laser, laser. That there, that's a master switch. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a wiring diagram for a house. And so what that is, is when you leave the house, there's a switch and you flip the switch and it turns off all non-essential electrics in the house. Uh, it keeps things that have got a clock attached to them and stuff like that on, so you have a sort of safe circuit. But it's a really good way to sort of cut down on your excess electricity usage. Um, voltage optimization is something we learned off, off Geoffrey Lean, uh, the environmental editor at The Independent, when we did his house. And that's a sort of flattening out of your voltage. So the volts that come in, my understanding of it, vary. And that is a thing that stops you getting big variation. And the nice thing about lighting now is pretty much all lighting is LED, which is, which is great. So it used to be that you had to persuade people to use LEDs because they were expensive and they were kind of a horrible blue light. But you can now get really lovely warm white, you know, 3000K um, lights, which are great and, and for an okay cost. And Another thing that's essential, ventilation. Generally, buildings in the UK, and, and when you speak to people from like Scandinavia, they can't believe it, have um, trickle vents to let in fresh air. So you can see, see that there? That's basically a hole, and you open it at the top and it lets air in, and that's how you get fresh air for the house, which is sort of nuts when you think about, I'm heating a house and I make lots of little holes in it to get air in. But, you know. um, and extract as well for your bathroom. And the great thing now is MBHR, and it does make a lot of sense because it's, it's swapping, you know, it's giving you fresh air and extracting air and you're not losing any heat. So, you know, this is what it looks like before you put the ceiling on. And it's, you know, a much more efficient thing to do in the winter. So I think MVHR is something that really we do all the time. I think it's going to become a lot more standard in house building. There is a new thing. We've just, just built this down in Croydon in a block of flats. So we're kind of interested to know how it works. But it's a, um, it's a combined air source heat pump and MVHR system. So we'll see if that works. Apparently, it's going to solve all of our problems. Still yeah, so it uses the heat. Yeah, so it's using the... Yeah, so it's mechanical ventilation heat recovery system, and it's got an air source heat pump that's essentially attached to it, and it uses the three-degree difference it gets from the heat exchanger to also then run the air source heat pump. Um, but it's a bit ominous, isn't it? It's a white box, and you can't take the front off it. I'm slightly worried about what happens when it goes wrong. And again, it's back to that people-centric design thing. You know, the nice thing about a gas boiler is everyone understands how that works. You know, any, every plumber in the world can fix it. Um, you know. uh, and, uh, oh, hang on, I've gone past one. There you go. Um, water, 
So again, low water usage fittings, that's something you can just get now. You can get fantastically good low water usage fittings. Um, it used to be that people, you get these really crappy showers, you know, six, six litres per, per minute, sort of bleh, horrible. But now they're kind of air eight and they're nice. Um, so that's really good. So they've improved a lot. Uh, I won't mention names because I'm being filmed, but there are some good makes available. Um, there are two extra things you can do, and they're very hard to justify. Well, one of them is, anyway, rainwater recycling, we always try and get in our projects. It's very hard to demonstrate payback. Essentially, rainwater recycling is where you store rainwater from your roof and you use it to flush your toilets or run your washing machine. That accounts for about two-thirds of your water usage. Um, the difficulty is that even with a water meter, you just can't demonstrate payback. I mean, to put one of those in the ground is about, is about five grand, basically. Um, and biodigester is a good thing to do. Can you get some fantastic modern biodigesters now? And, and quite often, a lot of our kind of more rural schemes are off-grid. So biodigester means that you know, you, you, you're just putting less weight on the infrastructure around you. Um, I'm just going to talk about solar. Solar thermal feels like a system that's actually integrated into your house. So solar thermal is, is what helps you make hot water. So with a solar thermal system, you can get about 60 or 70% of your hot water usage from the sun, which is brilliant. So I think solar thermal is pretty good. Photovoltaics is where, uh, essentially, uh, you know, it's what Einstein got his Nobel Prize for, actually. It's the, it's the photoelectric effect, where photons have a mass, and they hit a bit of silicon, and they knock an electron off, so you get a current running through it. And that's basically how they all work. Um, they're kind of going down in cost now, which is a good thing, but they are a bolt-on. So, you know, they're a thing you're doing to compensate for the fact that you, you haven't kind of got rid of all the carbon usage, if that makes sense. So they're good, but they're like a, they're like a thing to do to help your conscience. Um, and uh, we never do wind. Wind's impossible to um, demonstrate, and it makes a funny noise. So even this, which is the quiet revolution turbine, you know, th there's sort of noise issues associated with that, but it's just, they're, they're quite expensive things, and there's a 20-year payback, and, you know, um, they're, they're, they're quite hard to get through. What I thought I'd show you is a scheme that we've just finished um, and talk about how we managed to get rid of the systems on it as much as possible. So uh, it's a new um, lab art DT block for Cranley School down in Surrey. Um, and Cranley essentially are a really sporty, outdoorsy school. And they're in the Surrey Hills, so it's absolutely beautiful. And again, you know, we're kind of obsessed with landscape. One of the things I say about sustainability is um, the, the kind of the, the fourth and probably most overriding thing for us is always trying to reconnect back to a natural landscape. And we started with Cranley about how do we fit, sort of this is, this is the building here, and this is the campus of the school. So it's right in the middle. And what we talked to them about is how can we make this building tie into the landscape? You've got this amazing landscape around you and tie your campus together. And so this is the first sketch that we did with the headmaster, where essentially we were talking about not having any internal corridors. So having a kind of cloister space on the ground floor, uh, which links into the rest of the school and sort of parent-teacher hub, linking into landscape. And then the art department up here, linking onto a large external deck, which linked onto the kind of cricket and landscape area beyond. So it's this sort of thing where all the time you're connecting, connecting to the outside. And that's how it translates into sort of the final sections. So this is what's built. Um, mainly a timber frame building with a concrete slab for acoustic reasons. So remember I was talking about how we're having to sometimes do things that aren't timber now because we're getting into bigger building territory. One of the problems we're finding is acoustic rating with things like hotels and schools is quite difficult with, with a timber frame. And because of this, you know, in kind of basic building terms, you end up with uh, a building that's really connected to the outside. Like, it's a dual-aspect classroom. There's windows looking out on both sides onto the landscape. Um, you get good daylight inside. It's, it's a really beautiful space to learn. And it really connects with this sort of outside landscape and connects with Cranley's ethos of, of sporty outdoorsness. So you can see people here playing, and you've got this large deck here overlooking the space. So this is the building here facing onto the cricket pitch. But the other thing it does is it allows us to, to naturally ventilate the building, and it means we can have these quite tall spaces here for stratification as well, so we can make sure we've got the right overhangs, and we can thermally model the building to, to sort of <coughs> minimise energy usage. So we work with an um, M&E engineer called Skelly and Couch, 
really to minimise how much we need. And in the end, what we've got at Cranley is if you're, again, it's this thing I was talking about, if you're too hot, you open a window, if you're too cold, you turn on a radiator, and you're probably not going to be too cold, because um, we haven't even got a lot of radiators. Essentially, it's, it's very much a kind of self-maintained building, um, which provides a sort of nice, natural learning environment. You know, th there's a trend at the moment with new schools where they're kind of dead-end classrooms, and they're mechanically ventilated. And, and I think that it's so important that um, uh, buildings have this sort of, especially school buildings, have an element of naturalness, that they have this sort of natural ventilation, good, even daylight, and good connection to a sort of natural outdoor space. The other consequence of having no internal classrooms is that you, you connect with the rest of the school. So that's the, what would have been a corridor in the building, now connecting out with everywhere else and providing somewhere new to run around in and have fun and things like that, you know, things, things what kids do. Um, and then on the south side, on looking onto the cricket pitch, you end up with this really generous space connected to sort of the Surrey Hills landscape. So this is it here, which then means that the school has more than just a building. They also have a space for sort of functions and events. They do their speech day speeches here now, so the parents stand on the cricket pitch and um, they, they talk over the top. So it's, it's one of these things where quite a simple move, really, of removing all the internal corridors has made it a healthier, more natural learning environment. It's cut out most of the complex services that we may have needed, and it's given the school the sort of extra space that they didn't have before. Yeah, so it's the last section. You'll be relieved to know. Um, materials. Um, so I was just going to go through really some sort of nice natural materials in truth, and then show you some things that we've used. I think that there are some things which are really good and really popular and people really like, and one of them is timber floors. And there are lots of different types of timber floors. We, we try to use this kind of thing quite a lot, the sort of birch ply visa floor. I really like it because it's quite a kind of um, solid feel to it. Um, the classic is kind of these oak boards here, but the key thing to all of these is this sort of engineered board finish. So now, really, the, the most sustainable thing to do is to have uh, a finish on top with engineered, engineered below, because it means that you're not uh, having to take the best bits of the tree all the time to make your timber floor. Tiling, again, has got a lot better over the years. So um, this is from the Green Bottle Unit. This is, this is an entirely recycled glass tile. But things like you know, Pentagon tiles and Domus, now you can get 70 to 80% recycled tiles, which is really great. Plaster, there's a big range of plasters you can get now, uh, especially some much better kind of lime and natural plasters. And the nice thing about them is they have kind of less off-gassing. And paint, which is often overlooked, but there's two things about paint. Thing number one about paint is that it's made quite often of not very nice stuff. And you can get some great natural paints now from places like Oro. Um, and also, we've used a lot at Eden something called Dulux Light and Space, which is a slightly reflective paint. And it, it means that you, you get a kind of another half hour out of the daylight in your room. So you basically turn the lights on about half an hour later than you would, because it reflects daylight into the centre of the space, which is great. And also, you know, the importance of fittings. I think as architects, we quite often kind of ignore fittings, but um, we're always trying to reuse stuff. So you can buy second-hand kitchens, for example, from the used kitchen company. Oops, sorry. Um, there's a, there's a first furniture designer called Ed, Ed Rooney we love in Hackney who makes stuff out of old lab benches and things that he finds. And also with fittings, you can kind of steer a lifestyle. So um, recycling fittings that were there already, that's one nice thing to do. Um, making sure that people have spaces to dry their clothes so they don't have a tumble dryer. If you have a tumble dryer, that accounts for about 20 to 30% of your electricity usage, which is a lot. Um, and, you know, good space for recycling. So one of the things, you know, that's really important when you're thinking about things like kitchens or just where you work in your flat right now is, have I got separated recycling space? Have I got room to do it in? Have I got the right kind of bin, basically? Um, and I thought I'd just show you some nice materials. These are materials that we found that we really like. So material number one um, is this, which is charred larch cladding. So I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but essentially larch has a sort of resin on it. And if you burn the resin, it means you end up with this kind of blackened finish, which is really, really tough. So basically, it kind of never degrades over time. And this is actually from Japan. 
So it's really kind of beautiful matte finish. The Japanese make it with the kind of washi paper. So they, they put the larch together and they put washi paper between the bits of larch and they have an oven going at certain different temperatures um, to make a really beautiful, consistent finish. You can do it yourself. So if you've got a student project and you want to try it out, get a bit of larch and blowtorch it. Um, you can get a sort of even finish, not quite the same. And actually that house particularly was really nice for the range of finishes. Like they had a really good mix of sort of stone, concrete, timber. Um, lovely, lovely clients. Houses look a bit like clients, by the way. So, so like lovely clients get lovely houses. That's the, that's the deal. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, so brick, you know, brick is a natural material. Brick is clay, you know, fired clay. Uh, so this is quite a nice project we just finished in Hertfordshire where we used a local clay and we essentially made a kind of this, this brick patterned wall with it. You get lovely textures with brick. And, you know, timber, and, and when we started using timber a lot, especially timber cladding, we were sort of obsessed with trying to use high quality timber all the time. I was always thinking, I want this to be a beautiful, beautiful bit of kind of joinery, like I want the house to look like a bit of furniture. And the more we've been using timber, the more we've got into quite rough timber, we're getting rougher as we get older. Um, and, um, like, this is gravel boards. This is essentially boards that you kind of use for scaffolding, use as a cladding. And then it's really rough material, but then we've just lifted it with a bit of texture. So, you know, a bit of detailing, a bit of texture. Suddenly, although it is a rough material, it looks like something else. And that's a technique that we're now taking forward for the Eden Hotel. So this is a 110-bedroom hotel we're doing for the Eden Project at the moment. And one of the things we want to do is use... There's a, there's a thing called larch poles. So essentially, um, people grow a lot of larch, but they always grow too much, and they cut it all down and leave these bigger larch things to grow. When they do that, they end up with these things called larch poles, which are four and a half metre long bits of larch, which are essentially useless. But they're kind of not, because if you get the right carpenter on board, put someone like Charlie Brentnell from the AA or something, I've done this with him, he can, he can make stuff from those. He can make those into nice cladding panels. So we want to get local craftsmen on site using local larch pole, essentially a byproduct, um, and create this sort of textured box, you know, this textured cladding to the hotel. And I just wanted to mention on the hotel, the interesting thing about the hotel is the hotel really is all about landscape. So the hotel is part of, that's the, kind of back to the Eden project now, but that's the Eden project there. Those are the big biomes. And Eden are currently working on something called the Green Ribbon, which is sort of a, at the top of the pit, and it's essentially making a new learning landscape in and around Eden, where there's, there's a cookery school and there's somewhere to stay, and there's interventions in the landscape, uh, and, and the new hotel. And I was just going to finish. This is penultimate slide. Um, we really love landscape. I love landscape. We love natural materials. We do things like this a lot. So, um, and this is really where we're kind of learning our trade. So we run a course every year down on Dartmoor called Dartmoor Arts Spatial Structures. Uh, this is, oh, I think, 2015, where we made a pavilion. This is, this is everyone who helped make it. So we get sort of 15 architecture students. So um, that's Henry, the carpenter that year. Um, and then, you know, these are large poles, actually, interestingly, that we've, we've cut and bent into shape. But it's all local wood that we've cut down at the beginning of the week and we've made something by the end. And the thing I like about Dartmoor and the thing I really have learned from that and the thing we try to bring forward in all of our buildings is this connection to landscape and nature. And I think, in the end, we all have a desire um, to live a life that's very connected to the natural world. That's my kind of hypothesis. And I don't think that means, you know, we all want to live in a tree, but I think that it's our responsibility as architects to make sure that when you're creating spaces for people that there is a connection back to nature and everything that we do. Um, and I think that is probably the most sustainable thing you can do. Anyway, there you go. That's it. Cool. <laughs> Has anybody got any questions at all? A few? Yeah? Um, I've got a question about the timber. So it's CO2 and greenhouse. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cold in the heart, I know. It's the green that they are used. I mean, it's natural chemical, sort of. Sort of from the sort of like the green. Mm. Um, so it depends what it's getting used for. I mean, essentially, internally, it's a form of PVA glue, really, that they use for, for internal stuff. So it's the same as the PVA glued used model making, but it's a bit different. But 
Outside, though, they're a bit nastier, the chemicals, so they're a bit more resin-based. But yeah. um, for the heat recovery system, so yeah. basically the energy used to run for the distillation basically brings in the energy that would be used to heat up the whole system. Is that how it mechanically operates in that case? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very... It just runs all the time, and it's a little motor running. So there is an electricity. You know, it does need electricity to run it, because it's just literally ticking over. But it is, yeah, like you say, that's running all the time as a small electric fan, essentially, that's blowing that in exchange for not having a heating system. Okay, yeah. and I've already passed it out. Uh, yeah. What struck me in your section, you have this 400 mil thick wall, and then mm. the 20 centimeter thin uh, window. Thin. Uh, like, well, yeah, a very thin window. I mean, I yeah. like the contrast. So is your window actually losing a lot of it just by like, being maybe double or triple? Yeah, the windows are all, so with a passive house, everything has to be passive house certified. Um, and the windows are all, all triple glazed and like double sealed as well. Um, so that they're, they're, they are, if you see them in real life, I should have brought, I, I, you know, we've got sections of them in the office. In the office, they look weirdly large. It's just compared to the size of the wall, they look dinky and tiny. So it's a bit odd. Yeah. Hello. Oh, Hello. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'd say that the decision to go passive house versus like uh, a sustainable house where you don't worry about it so much, so you don't have to buy everything passive house, probably costs about 10 to 15% more. So there definitely is an uplift. Um, one of the snags I think <coughs> moving forwards is that we, um, a lot of the passive house certified components come from Europe and there's more in the UK available now but, but not for everything. So obviously, as import costs have gone up a bit recently, so that's unhelpful for passive house things. But yeah, it's a bit more expensive, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I should have I should have put it in the PowerPoint actually. We we quite have to do a map of where things come from. Um and you have to do that for Eden. Uh, and so, I mean, Eden, yeah, we quite often do a map of where thing come, things come from, and I should have put that in the, in the presentation because it's really instructive. And you tend to find that um, you can source quite a lot locally, but there's quite often something specialist that you can't. And e Eden is quite classic for that. So something like the core building, most of the core building came from stuff in Cornwall or Devon. Um, but then the timber frame came from Switzerland, which is like crazy, right? But, but it's because it's a double curved glue lamp frame and they were the only people who could do it. Um, so that, that's, that's the thing. You have this sort of slight dichotomy quite often. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, we just don't use them, sorry. I mean, that's no, fine. No, I know them, I like them and everything, and I've seen, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quite a nice clay version that Prince Charles used to make his house at the um, BRE Centre. Um, yeah, no, I think they're really good. I just like, actually, the truth is, I'm sort of an ex-Grimshaw person, and we, 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 I don't like wet trades much. So we, sort of, so we sort of shy a little bit away from wet trades, if I'm being really honest, which, which, is, which is just a sort of hangover, I think, from you know, um, working at a high-tech company for 10 years. But no, it's totally, I mean, they're, they're, they're really good. And also they've got, like Hempcrete, they've got a bit of thermal mass to them as well, which, is, which means that they can help, help with that. So no, there's nothing, they're good. They're really good. Just, I just, just don't use them. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we use underfloor heating quite often when we put a screed in. Um, I think underfloor heating 
So first of all, I guess the pacifiers don't have unrepeated because they don't have heating. One of the things about heating systems, you know, and one of the big debates we have with clients is when are you occupying this house and how sporadically? Because um, underpleating, I, I think underpleating is really great and it's fantastic because you get this sort of um, thermal flywheel effect, you know, you get a lovely slab connected to the house. So say that house I showed you in Suffolk, that's got this great exposed concrete slab. So in the winter, it's lovely and warm. In the summer, it acts as a cooling system effectively. Um, but the Eden Hotel, we've shied away from <laughs> underfloor heating completely uh, because we want it to be responsive. And the trouble with underfloor heating is, is it actually it's quite a slow thing. So it's great for kind of constant occupancy and bad for sporadic occupancy, I think, as a theory. But you know, I mean, I, like, it's just our experience, you know. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Any others? Oh, no. Yeah. 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 No, no. Well, you're, I mean, you're, you're totally right. There, there is a thing to worry about, which is, is my MVHR working? Um, I mean, you don't turn it on and off is one thing. It's just always running slowly. You do have to change the filters, you know, and you should redo really that once a year. Uh, so that is something that you do have to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess as a maintenance regime, it's not that bad. The nice thing about MVHR is what you find is that um, there's a sort of weird loop that rooms do in the winter where they get too stuffy and people open the windows and they get too cold and they shut the windows and they get too stuffy and open the windows and it sort of does that kind of thing. And then with an MVHR system, you just find that the CO2 levels remain constant and that, and that you know, that's sort of comfort levels in theory are higher. But I would stress that, you know, we have done 25 new build sustainable houses now. Every single one of them, we've tried to persuade the client to go passive house, and only three have. So that's quite instructive about once, and they all started talking about passive house, but once you explain to them exactly what it is, you know, you've got to want to live in a passive house to live in a passive house, basically. You know, if, it's, if you're not into it, it's not, you know, it's not for you, basically. You know, a bit like architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so again actually on the Eden, on the Eden Hotel we're going to have a boost which you can turn on uh, to get more air in if you feel like you want more air so that we, you can put a booster system on. Obviously, if you keep it on, you're using more, more electricity. Um, so then that, you know, there's a sort of trade-off there. So you, you can have a boost, but I guess keeping it boosted would be unhelpful. I mean, I think you touched on a really interesting point, which is, which is you know, and I haven't touched on, I'm surprised no one's going to badger me on it, our existing building stock. We, we tend to do a lot of new build stuff. So, you know, but British houses are sort of these big, heavy, leaky things. Because they're, they're, they're leaky because they all had fires in every single room and you had to get air in to feed that fire, right? And you know, you put a fire on and it heats the chimney stack uh, and, and then and you do that every day. And now we've all got central heating systems which um, really you should have quite an airtight building. And so there's a sort of bit of a conflict really with the type of heating systems we have and the type of buildings we've inherited in the UK, especially in London with Victorian leaky houses. But, yeah. Uh, so it is, a, it, it, well, it is a brand in that there is a Passive House Institute and they will give you your certificate. 
uh, but it's basically a giant calculation tool. If you're interested, I'm sure that um, Westminster has a, a PHPP calculation that you could use. It's a giant Excel spreadsheet. Like, if, you know, it's kind of interesting. You could put one of your buildings into it, one of your student projects, and see precisely what energy usage you're going to get from it. It's, it's like really incredible. I mean, it, it's very single-minded in its attitude towards sustainability. You know, it's just talking about energy. There are lots of other bits about sustainability to talk about, but yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Brilliant.